I'm going to talk about like private searching or private transactions. This um, uh, work, like stuff I've been working on the, the recent weeks. Um, here, so let's jump right into it. Um, what do I mean by private searching on private transactions? Um, I assume that users want to receive kickbacks on the MEV they generate, um, but they, they still want to keep their transaction secret. And at the same time, searchers want to keep their intellectual property secret, right? They don't want to reveal their um, searching strategies to competitors. Um, so the question is, can we have both? Can we, is, is this possible? Can searchers generate front running and back run and or back running transactions under these conditions? Um, since we're in the area of private computing here, like an obvious um, first step is SGX. And when I say SGX here, like, um, I, I use it synonymously for trusted um, uh, execution environment. So I'm just using SGX. So a like, very simple setting here, user, the user's input um, is a transaction, the input to an enclave, the searcher inputs a program, the, uh, within the SGX enclave to runs a program that takes the searcher program and executes it upon the transaction. And it outputs a, outputs a signed transaction, signed background that is um, sent to the builder. So that sounds great, but there's a, um, a catch to that, right? It's the catch is like covert channels. I'm quickly explain what covert channels are because it's it's a very niche topic and hardly anyone knows about it. Um, so covert channels are um, ways to secretly convey information. Like in order to do that, they they piggyback on on so-called overt channels. And if you're coming from like a telecommunications background, you can also think of covert channels. Um, as a way to secretly modulate information on an existing carrier signal. It's a bit of abstract. Most people understand it when you com um, compare covert channels to side channels because people are usually aware of what side channels are. Um, it's just a difference in the attacker model. So with side channels, the attacker extracts, um, aims to extract information, um, but the attacker does that by observing, the, um, observing let's say for example, and from, from outside the system. For example, there's an algorithm running um, and the attacker can observe the, the power consumption. I think that's a very classic example. But with covert channels, um, the attacker has the same goal, so to extract the information, but it additionally has support from inside the system. So there's um, basically a colluder, right? So you can also see why there's a, um, a stronger attack here. How does that um, relate to the SGX thing? Well, if I think about it, um, what are like potential over channels here? Um, like the, the signed background, right? This is the, the output. Can the, can the searcher program um, manipulate the, the signed background? Well, obviously, obviously yes. Um, the program could be as simple as saying, well, take, this, take the user input and um, this, is, this is the output. So in order, to, in order to protect against that, we could encrypt. Um, another over channel would be network communication. This, the searcher program could be as simple as saying, well, um, open a network connection to a host, take the user transaction and send it over to the network. So um, we, we need to filter that. Um, but it, it gets tricky if you think over channels in terms of CPU and memory of the host system. I think uh, Andrew Miller, Andrew Miller um, um, had a similar point here. So how can we ensure that the searcher program does not encode secret information in um, CPU or memory access or usage patterns? You can think of, let's say, um, encoding information in how much CPU is used. Let's say you're using CPU for one second to encode a one or for two seconds to encode a zero and leak information that way. And that is, that is very hard to protect against. So there's different ways on how to how to go about this. Well, we, there seems to be a trade-off, right? Like how expressive should the searcher program be versus like the, the existence of information leakage or covert channels. We can start with a fully expressive program, searcher program, um, then check, is there a covert channel? Yes, restricted. Let's say, let's say we don't allow network communication. Is there still a covert channel? Yes, okay, we, I don't know, we, we prevent for loops, let's say, but there's always the question, is there any leakage left? We could go the other way around, say um, we start um, like a fully restrictive program um, and, and ask the question, is it useful, right? So if the searcher program can't do anything, it's obviously useless. So we say, okay, let's 
um, allow additions, for example. Is it useful? Well, probably not. The question is, at what point is it useful enough? It's also hard to say. Um, or we could start, start somewhere in the middle between in the expressiveness level. Um, the question is then like, where should we go from there? Um, what we decided to do is like to start with um, um, MPC because MPC um, interestingly um, like guarantees that the parties cannot learn um, anything but the output of the function. So there are no covert channels there. Like as a general statement, like what is MPC? It allows multiple parties to jointly compute a public function while keeping their inputs secret. So this is a good start to explore the design space. Going back to the original question, like secrets searching on secret transactions, how, how would this look um, with MPC? Um, so instead of using SGX, um, we now have like an MPC backgrounding protocol, right? We don't know yet what this would look like. Um, and again, we have like the user input a transaction, search input a program, um, and the output is a signed backgrounding transaction. We just don't know, like the question is like, what is the backgrounding protocol or like, how does it work? And what is the searcher program? Um, and we started experimenting um, in the MP speeds framework. It's a general um, MPC framework. And I'm gonna quickly present um, the, the current state of the proof of concept. All right, so first thing, what is the, this, what is the searcher program look like? It turns out like a searcher language can be pretty simple. So the searcher program can just consist of like a list of constants, a list of computing instructions and computing instructions are very simple. So it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, maybe square root. That's not, a, not super simple, but still it's um, relatively simple instruction, but note that there are no loops and there's no branching. We cannot allow that. Um, there's a couple of comparison instructions and the list of references for the populating the, the backgrounding transaction. So what is the what does the backgrounding protocol? Right here is this middle thing. What is the back does the backgrounding protocol look like? Um, turns out it's also like this is um, like simplified um, Python-like code, but it's just to highlight how it how it works on a on a high level. Um, we have like a protocol internal storage. Um, if you think about what a transaction is, it's just um, RLP encoded data. So the first thing is to decode the data, make it a, um, and populate the storage with that. Second step is take the constants from the searcher, populate the storage with that. Next step, take the searcher's computations, execute the computations one by one on the storage, um, and then um, run the comparisons. So the searcher provides a couple of comparisons and note here that there's a success variable and all of the comparisons must be true in order for the success variable to remain true. Um, then in the end, like the, the backgrounding um, transaction gets populated. I think the interesting part here is that um, in the end, the uh, backgrounding transaction is sent to the builder if and only if all of the comparisons were true. So this is a very abstract introduction of how the proof of concept works. We can um, walk through an example. I guess this makes it a bit easier to understand. So this is a, an example with a real world transaction from last month. A user sold um, 3.75 ETH for USDT on the Uniswap B2 pool. So first step for the protocol would be to decode the transaction and populate the storage. So you can see the non scarce limit, whatever. So that's the, the entire transaction. In the second step, um, the protocol loads the constants from the provided by the searcher. Um, there's a couple of, um, I won't go in, into all the details, but it's um, constants for the comparison, for the backgrounding amount, uh, and for the backgrounding transaction. Uh, what is important to note here is that the searcher also provides um, on-chain information, right? For, for example, here is the, the WE the number of WE tokens in the pool at that point in time, or the number of USDT tokens at that point in time. And I think it's a fair assumption because the, the searcher already knows for this for its uh, strategy, like what on-chain information is needed. And we can expect the searcher to provide exactly that information. So there's no need for the backgrounding protocol to query um, 
the, the um, EVM the, the, or the um, Ethereum P2P network for additional information. We can just assume the searcher to provide that information. So, but um, what is the strategy now for the for the searcher? Right, the searcher wants to backrun a Uniswap um, trade. Um, the the searcher kind of um, knows that uh, in this particular trade, the user sold um, uh, ETH to to the to the pool. So the size of the pool increased and took out USDT from the pool. So the, this slightly affected the price. Obviously, the searcher knows that. So the um, the, the price of ETH went down slightly. So the question for the searcher is like, how much should I put it? Like how much, what is the amount I, should, I can put in in order to um, move the price up again to a certain target price? Um, and you can use the formula, like I'm not gonna go into the details of the formula, but it's um, important to note here. It's just like a couple of simple computations. You have a couple of um, multiplications and additions like a division in the square root. And all the information is either provided by the searcher, right? So the, the fee of the Uniswap market, the target price, um, the precision is like the, the number of decimals for the, for the, um, the WEF token, um, or it can be computed um, from the um, inf on chain inf the, in the information provided by the searcher and the user's transaction. For example, the Y is the amount of ETH in the Uniswap V2 pool after the user's trade. And then that can be computed by the amount of ETH uh, in the pool before the trade, plus the, plus the amount that the user put in minus the fee. So all of this can be computed. Obviously, like the, uh, very important for the search is also like, is the background profitable, right? So this is also part of the strategy. So this is like on a high level, the strategy like uh, we implemented in the proof of concept. How does this look like in this searcher language? So this is not nice to read and this is just a snippet. I'm only gonna explain the first line here. So this is like the 4229. So it's, this reference is just the, um, the fourth item in the storage, two references a multiplication and 29 is the 29th item in the storage. So fourth item is the amount, the value in the user transaction multiplied, multiplied by the, in this case, searcher provided constant, the fee. And this is like step-by-step, step, um, the backgrounding protocol can execute the computations provided by the searcher. Um, obviously, like it's important that the searcher wants to um, send the backgrounding transaction if and only if um, the user transaction actually is a um, um, selling E for USDT because the strategy, um, the computations provided is really targeted for that. And uh, if the background is profitable. So there's a couple of comparisons like they work similar way. If you look at the first line, this three, four, 23 is um, the third storage item. This is the two address of the, um, of the user transaction for in this case is um, uh, the equal operator and 23 is the Uniswap V2 router address that was provided by the searcher as a constant. Um, just a couple of comparisons, probably the last line is the, um, also an important one is the background profit um, greater than zero. Um, so if all those transactions, um, are all those comparisons are true, then the backgrounding transactions is, is created. The creating the backgrounding transaction is actually the simplest part of simplest part of that. It is just a, a list of references to storage. So let's say that like it's 40. This is the the 40th element in the storage. This is nonce, and you have the gas limit, gas price, um, and so on. And these items are like the, the values are taken from the from storage, RLP encoded. Um, uh, this is the backgrounding transaction. So so this is the the proof of concept. Um, there's a couple of open questions with that. Um, first of all, is the um, searcher language um, expressive enough to be useful? My, my gut feeling is yes, but it's, I'm also not a searcher. So um, input on that is highly appreciated. You could also see like the, the searcher language, like this is very low level and this is very cumbersome and error prone to, to work with. Um, so what would a what, what should a high level language look like that compiles down to this low level language? Um, and also like how can we make this practical? I mean, this proof of concept implemented in the MP speeds framework, um, like on the single transaction, a single um, searcher strategy, 
takes uh, like in the, in the strongest security model takes like 40 hours to compute and a couple of hundred gigabytes of back and forth communication. So this is nowhere practical. So, um, so how, how to make this how to make this practical, right? I mean, we could recall like we started experimenting with MPC because um, we needed to restrict the expressiveness of the searches program. And now we, we arrived at the design that we could, um, uh, that is like um, restricted and hopefully expressive enough. So can we use that and now, now implement it um, using SGX and create a practical solution? Um, probably we also need to emulate some MPC-like behavior, like execute all branches, um, have constant time functions, but, but maybe that's a way forward. Um, another way would be to um, go for uh, application-specific MPC or um, with homomorphic encryption. Um, why is that? If you if you zoom out a bit, um, and the, the, um, the, the proof of concept design basically has three phases, right? This extract the data from the user transaction. This could happen like on on the user machine. So this is this is easy. The user could use that and encrypt it, send it over to the searcher. Then the searcher does a couple of computations on the extracted data and the sub, some constants. Um, that sounds exactly like homomorphic encryption. And if you think about it, like the um, we only need to support like very limited um, operations. So maybe partially homomorphic encryption is sufficient. Um, and if if it is, then we have like um, reasonable um, like uh, ho partially homomorphic encryption sch schemes with reasonable performance that exist already today. Um, for me, like a big open question is like we also need to enforce certain conditions under which the backrunning transaction is revealed, and um, I have no clue how to do that in a in a practical way. So if you have ideas, like go ahead, share it. Um, um, yeah. So so that's it. Like the takeaways. From this talk, if if it's if it's just the two takeaways, covert channels um, are a threat to SGX uh, deployments, and they should be considered. And private searching on private transactions um, may be possible, even even though they are not um, obviously not practical at the moment. Any questions? Wow! Thank you, Robert, for this talk. Uh, very interesting for me. I didn't appreciate the covered channels for SGX. But w w w I don't, I guess I don't completely understand the how covered channels are addressed in the in the MPC case. Like, go ahead. Yeah, um, um, for me, like before I started with like playing around with MPC, I had like the same issue, like same question. Um, the, the fun thing is, or for me, the, the, the insight was like, um, they're just not an issue with MPC. They just don't occur. They're they're all um already by their um, um because it, you by design you cannot leak information. That's the so. well. A very simple MPC is just the constant function that returns all the inputs, uh, you know, without any doing any operation, and that leaks everything, leaks the whole inputs. So that would have. Uh, Okay, okay, sorry. Like it doesn't leak any information apart from the output. Right. Okay, but what can I react to this itself? a little bit? Like, um, the when writing an MP speech program, you still kind of have the problem that you have to do if you have an array and you want to do an index into that array that depends on some data, like an input dependent uh, lookup. You're forced to either do a linear scan through the whole array, which costs a lot. Uh, or leak something by you know publishing which value in the index you want to do and, and doing some kind of interaction like that. So you either need to take this performance penalty or try to you could use an ORAM within an MPC. That's like one of the things that the you know uh, cryptography theory relies on sometimes. Um, exactly. But the, the same is, problem is, seems uh, to show up anyway. Right, but this is how the proof of concept works. So it uses like a the storage is like an ORAM and it works on on that. I think if um, can you also do any distinction between like covert channel and um, a side channel? Like I think that they're they're different, and to me that the difference is kind of addressed by um, uh, remote attestation at least in the SGX setting because um, you know if a 
if a covert channel would be built into the code, it should be visible to, you know, auditors looking at the source code to be able to check. And at least with remote attestation, you know, you have that option. And and then if you um if you check that the code only does linear scans in SGX, just like you would have to with MPC, you'd be getting the same guarantee that it's not leaking a channel because it is um doing a data independent uh, access. I think that the tricky question is like, can the the input to your program, right, um, that runs within SGX, can the input to the program um, change the program execution flow in such a way that it leaks information? Um, and sure, you can like if you analyze the program and you make sure that this is not the case. Uh, um, I, I totally agree. I just think it's it's very hard. It's it's an analysis that's very hard to conduct. I, I guess my question on the MPC was um, like how can you guarantee that the program will output something which is ex you know expected let's say the program is a builder program which builds a block what if instead of building a block it just outputs just the input transactions well maybe in some cases it, it like let's say 99 percent of the case it outputs a block like the expected output but then if mev is over let's say a thousand eth it just leaks all these transactions, and then uh, the attacker can just uh, uh, can just front run. Uh, I, I guess that's a, that's an issue. It's just um, maybe I want um, should have clarified like the, the the scope for the proof of concept. It's just a user searcher interface, right? So the output is sent to the builder, and the builder could see everything in clear text. And in this case, like I don't bother with that, like the builder is assumed to be trusted. So let's say the, the searcher leaks the user transaction. Um, it just, it can leak to the builder and the builder is, is trusted in this setting. So I didn't go any further than beyond this user search interface. Strategy remains private uh, among the user and searcher, um, but not among like the, the output is then um, shared with the, with the builder and the builder can see everything. Well, you can see the output. Okay, so, so you're I right. think the the searcher does not get access to the output, only the builder in the no. plain text. Yeah, yeah. Aha, uh -huh, I see. But the builder is trusted, right? The builder could act upon the information. Okay, understood.